Torah portion for this Shabbat is called Parshat Ki Tavo. When you get to Parshat Ki Tavo and you don't have your high holiday tickets, you're late. <laughs> In this Torah portion, Moses is actually in the last day of his life. And he says to the Israelites, after he sort of laid down all the consequences of how they might choose to behave when they head into the land of Israel, he reminds them that they have experienced amazing, incredible things over the course of their long journey of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And then he says, you know, something amazing has happened over the course of this journey. He says, Velo natan Adonai lachem lev ladaat ve'enaim lirot ve'oznaim lishmoa ad hayom hazeh. He says, you know, it hasn't been up until this very day that you have really had any way of having any knowledge or awareness, eyes that see or ears that hear really up until this very day. And I was thinking about that idea because somebody asked me a question this week that said, it was a Catholic uh, friend of mine, they say, you know, we're supposed to go to confession like all year. And you guys seem more efficient. You just, <laughs> you just sort of get it all done in one day. And I said, no, 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 repentance, as Rabbi Maid said earlier, repentance, teshuva, is actually a process that's supposed to be ongoing all the time. And he said, well, all right, well, if that's the case, then, you know, what's that whole Yom Kippur thing for? Why is it that we, if repentance is supposed to be something that's ongoing, that's like a daily practice, why is it that we then have this one day called the Day of Atonement? And... What's interesting is what a Hasidic commentary, the Sfat Emet, teaches about this verse. He said, the fact is that at the end of 40 years, the Israelites were given a gift called Torah. And it was only upon the last steps of their journey that God actually gave them the full corpus of the teaching of Torah. And Rabbi Aaron Leib Smokler uh, who was commenting on the comment, this is how Judaism works, right? Said that there's something amazing that happens, right? When we're in the course of our lives, when we're kind of doing our thing, we're not always really aware of why it is that we're doing what we're doing or what the meaning or the impact will be of that particular event on that particular day. How many of you went to college. Good. How many of you think one day you might go to college? Well, that's good. How many of you, I don't really want to go to college. All right, well, you'll get there. So how many of you know what you want to major in, young people who haven't yet gone to college? How many of you know, for shooting sure, sitting here right today, you know what you want to major in? Really, Lior? You know what, you, what are you majoring in? Law? That makes so much sense. <laughs> that bird loves to argue. <laughs> Anybody else who's young know exactly what you want to study at this stage of the game when you get to college? How many of you finished college like decades ago and you still don't know what you want to study? <laughs> So I went to college thinking that I was going to study economics or history. I learned after my fourth economics course, actually it's halfway through my fourth economics course, that there was this terrible thing involved with economics called numbers <laughs> and mathematics. And, and math and numbers have not been my friend. Uh, so. I ended up my first semester at college taking a, a, a seminar called The Moral Challenges of the 20th Century. And it was a great class, and it was all about this really interesting social ethics and philosophy 
And then my professor said, did you like that class? He was my advisor. I said, love that class. He says, you should take a philosophy class. And I said, a philosophy class? And he said, yeah, that's what we've been doing. I'm like, okay, I'll take a philosophy class. And I liked it. And then he said, so you should probably try a religion class. I said, a religion class? He said, yeah, it's called the philosophy and religion department. I said, okay. And I love these courses. And then I realized I was in the middle of New York State. I was frozen solid. And I have to declare a major. And it wasn't going to be econ. And I realized, you know what? I think I'm going to be a philosophy and religion major. And then a friend of mine told me that she had spent a year at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and that she had had an amazing time. And she was cute. <laughs> and I figured if there's more like her, that's a good way to spend a year. And I went to the Hebrew University. And several amazing things happened that year at Hebrew U. One is, I met a really cute Jewish girl. And I married her. And she's still married to me. Poor woman. But I also took these amazing classes in modern Jewish theology, modern Jewish philosophy, and I spent two to three days a week at an ultra-Orthodox yeshiva in the old city, and it was because of the confluence of all those experiences that I said, you know what, I think I might want to be a rabbi. Now, when I look back over that journey, it kind of seems sort of obvious that I was aiming in this direction so that I could stand here before you today. But at the time, along the way, not obvious at all. If you had known me when I was around that age, you would never have guessed that I was going to be a rabbi. When I talk to my friends from high school, they still giggle about it. But when I look back over the path, well, of course it led this way. And, you know, I suspect that the Israelites who were standing on the shores of the Jordan River looking out into the promised land they had traveled 40 years to reach didn't imagine that all of the experiences they had along the way, the gift of Torah at Sinai, and then that horrible debacle with the golden calf and all the plagues that were associated with and the construction of the tabernacle and bringing together all those gifts and fashioning all of those pieces of furniture and schlepping it through the wilderness and the incident with the spies where they lost faith in their ability to have conquest and all of the paths that they took, all the moments they had camp, all of the conversations they had in the tent, all of the anguish they had with their children, and all of the things that happened to them along the way brought them to where they were finally then able and ready to enter into the promised land. And it was only after the entire journey had been concluded that they were able to have, as Moses said, lev ladaat, a mind with awareness, a naim lirot, eyes that could really see, oznaim lishmoa, ears that could really hear. Without that experience, without the fullness of the journey, you can't really appreciate what it was that you experienced and what it all means. We're almost at the end of the year 5782. It's been a long journey. Think about everything you've experienced since last Rosh Hashanah. Think about all that you've participated in all the events in your family, amongst your friends, all the things you've learned, all of the things that were incredibly difficult and painful, all of the things that were below your mind joyous and wondrous, all of the little moments that contributed to the people who are gathered here in this sacred space on the precipice of a new year. What Elul does for us, what Slichot does for us, what this holy month does for us is give us the same opportunity as our ancestors had thousands of years ago in the wilderness to use the gift of awareness, eyes that see, ears that hear, to look back over our journey and to try to figure out what did it all mean. And when we find that we're able to see the patterns and generate some answers and see where we lacked 
to see where we weren't exactly who we needed to be and what we wanted to achieve, perhaps we will set for ourselves a more clear and a more wise agenda for the new year that soon begins. Shabbat Shalom.